Uh, there is a long discussion about whether or not the Quran talks about covering the face, the the what we call niqab, right? Um, I have my own opinion on the issue, but you should do your own research. I will share my opinion, but that's not binding because the fuqaha have disagreed on this issue for a long time. There's never been any consensus on this, okay? Uh, but I will share with you what I'm more convinced of. There, there's people in my family uh, that wear niqab. Right, so it is in my family. Actually, I had done research on it a long time ago before I got married. I just did research because I wanted to know, ninja or not ninja. Like I wanted to know, right? So, um, and the conclusion I came to then uh, was actually that it's uh, mustahab, meaning it's preferred by some ulama, and it's part of the Arab norm by other ulama that has nothing to do with. Implementation of Sharia. Others, yet others would argue that it's specific to the mothers of the believers. Because remember, their standards were higher. So they were actually told to completely seclude themselves from society and even the, the box that she had to travel in, radiallahu ta'ala anha. So it was specific to them. And then in light of this hadith, other women, Allah's messenger is going easier on them, right? So that's not uh, obligatory on them. Now, some women do it out of love of the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, and that's rewarded, you know, commendable. But it cannot be imposed necessarily on the rest of the Ummah. Okay? Uh, but anyway, uh, the this is Ibn Ashur's commentary. على أن استثناء إبداء الوجه والكفين من عموم منع إبداء زينتهن يقتضي إباحة إبداء الوجه والكفين في جميع الأحوال. And actually, that hadith demonstrates that in most situations, showing the face and hands is completely fine. أن يكون للمستثنى جميع أحوال المستثنى منه وتأويل الشافعي وتأوله الشافعي بأنه استثناء في حالة الصلاة. Then he criticized Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. I'm no one to criticize him. Ibn Ashur was a Maliki Mufassir. So Malikis and Shafi'is have a lot of fun with each other. You know, so they, they take a few jabs here and there in their tafsirs too. So he says, Imam Shafi'i says that women can show their face only in Salah and I have no dalil, he has no dalil for it or whatever. So he goes after him on that. But I do know this, uh, that um, this was found among the Sahabiyat. But actually, the vast majority of the Sahaba, with the exception of two individuals, and one very far more authentically than the other, that they did not actually impose uh, niqab. The vast majority of them did not hold that view. And the two that did, one of them, for example, Abdullah bin Salam, right, uh, who was actually pre previously uh, Jewish, and he believed on many issues that Quran confirms the injunctions of Torah. He believed whatever fiqh of Torah that he knew, he believed that, because Allah says, مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ Torah. So if you study his views, you have to understand where he's coming from. He's coming from the rabbi background. Right? And he sees that as a confirmation of previous scripture. Now in the rabbi background, if a woman's pinky shows, it's the same as zina. And they're, they're very extreme. So you'll find the, the tougher opinions on women will come from Abdullah bin Salam. Okay, or people that are from the Qabila of Hudayl, Sahaba that are from Hudayl. Now Hudayl was a, a, a Qabila where women were secluded far more. Like if a woman was going through her menses, they would keep them in a separate tent and they wouldn't even touch them. And so you'll, and Umar bin al-Khattab is from Hudayl. So you'll have much tougher opinions about menses and things like that from Umar bin al-Khattab. Because that's not just Islam, it's actually part of how he was raised and how his cultural background too. You cannot separate the Sahaba from their tribes. You can't. That's, that sociology is important to study and understand. Okay? And when people say, well, this Sahabi said it, therefore it's Sharia, that's immature. Unless Sahaba completely agree on something, and there's no disagreements among them, you cannot quote one Sahabi and make it Sharia. Sharia doesn't come from Sahaba, Sharia comes from Allah and His Messenger وسلم, and Sahaba will have acceptable interpretations within Sharia but not imposed interpretations. Imposed interpretations is when the Sahaba all agree. When the Sahaba all agree and on these kinds of issues the Sahaba didn't all agree. 
And it's unfair for people to just say, well, all the ulama agreed. All the scholars agreed. All the sahaba agreed. Oh yeah? Name ten of them. Uh, all of them. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about, don't say it. Don't just throw these words out there. There's complete consensus on this issue. Oh yeah? Consensus of who? All the scholars. Okay, name twelve. No, no. Uh, um, con consensus. I'll be right back. <laughs> don't you don't use these words if you don't know what you're talking about. It's okay. I've told this funny story before. I'll tell you again. There are some people who love where's your dalil? Where'd you get your dalil from? It was my teacher, Dr. Akram Nadwi, one time. His teacher was in a class teaching hadith, and this, and he mentioned a fatwa, and the student said, "Aina dalil ya sheikh? Where's dalil? Where did it come from?" And he says. حَدَّثَ فُلَانٌ عَنْ فُلَانٌ عَنْ فُلَانٌ عَنْ فُلَانٌ عَنْ فُلَانٌ He mentioned this one's name uh, on the authority of this one, narrated by this one, narrated by this one, narrated by this one. And he mentioned like a 12 people chain. And he said, are you, are you, sap are you satisfied? And the 18-year-old the student goes, yeah, نعم, شكراً. And he goes, you idiot, I just named all the students in the class. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know what you're 